We're pleased, very pleased today to have Joyce Leader join us, uh, a former Foreign Service officer. She's a retired officer who was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Rwanda and was a U.S. observer to the peace talks. Uh, and, and so she has a lot of experience and was. it's very timely that we have her here with us to, to see uh, these events and share her experience. She ended her State Department career as an ambassador to the Republic of Guinea in West Africa. And after retiring, she returned to coordinate a State Department peace building initiative in the Great Lakes region of Africa. She specializes in political affairs, refugee affairs, human rights, conflict resolution, and international organizations. And her book is uh, available uh, from Hope to Horror, the book that Joyce has just uh, published will be available uh, at a special price to, to those of you who are here and who uh, contact info at adst.org uh, to get more information of how you can get that book. So Joyce, we're very pleased to have you here. I will mute myself and uh, turn off my camera. We're very eager uh, to hear your presentation. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you are you hearing me properly? We hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much, for uh, Mark, for your introduction. And uh, I want to let, extend my thanks to ADST for inviting me to talk with you today about my new book that came out just before the uh, lockdown started. So we're going to these virtual presentations, which is a lot of fun. Let me give, pay a special tribute to ADST's stalwart Marjorie Thompson. She's the editor of the ADST DACOR Diplomatic and Diplomacy series of books. And I commend her for sticking with me over many years and providing wise guidance and at critical moments in the publication process while juggling several other authors at the same time. Without her and her expert help, there would be no book. Thank you, Marjorie. And thanks to all of you in the audience. I hope that my talk will offer enough of an enticement for you to buy the book and not so much that you say, oh, that's boring and don't, don't want to even look for it. Um, I, the book tells the story of how I saw and understood what was going on in Rwanda during the years before the genocide broke out in April of 1994. Uh, I, I left on, on one of the convoys on the, the, in that month, in that time frame. And the, um, the, uh, from my vantage point as a diplomat at the embassy, it's my analysis of the political wrangling over power sharing arrangements in the new government that was intended to lead to multi-party elections, human rights abuses blatantly carried out with impunity by government linked groups to sow fear and hatred in the population, and the peace talks that attempted to lay the foundation for a new future. It includes some analysis, uh, some conclusions about how I think we might be at what kind of problems we had and as diplomats and uh, how we could strengthen democracy, democracy to make more effective in future similar situations. And that's the part I wanted to uh, focus on today, but I do need to set the stage a little bit. So let me get started. The background to the genocide. There were two transitions underway. One, uh, there were two transitions underway and three groups that were vying to control these transitions so that they, it would be adv advantageous to them, the way it would come out, the, the result would be advantageous to their group. The two transitions were one to, democratiz to democracy, um, multi-party pluralism from a one-party state that the president and his entourage had uh, controlled and monopolized the power in for 20, nearly 20 years. And this, uh, and, but the French were pressing them under threat of losing economic and military aid to give up this one party state and turn to a more open pol political process. And so they did, they announced that they would end their one party state legalize political parties and uh, prepare for multi-party elections. 
The second transition that was underway was from war to peace. Just a few months after the president announced the end to his one party rule, uh, an armed group of mostly Tutsi refugees called the Rwandan Patriotic Front invaded Rwanda from Uganda in October, uh, October of 1990. They were demanding the right for the refugees to return to Rwanda, which had been routinely denied by the president on grounds that there weren't, wasn't enough room for them and their cattle. And they were also wanting to, uh, for the Tutsi to be able to participate in the political liberalization process. Despite many diplomatic efforts to uh, bring this conflict to a close, it was, uh, there continued to be a simmering conflict at the border for one and a half years until the RPF, which is the Rwandan Patriotic Front, and the Rwandan government agreed to a ceasefire and peace talks. So the three groups that were trying to control these transitions and were each hoping to leverage democratization and the peace process to its own advantage. So let me quickly run through who those three groups were. First, of course, was the Hutu that were in power. The Hutu from the minority, the majority group, uh, ethnic group in the country, and the, the, the president and his entourage from Northern Rwanda wanted to retain power. This is my conclusion that in fact, even though they announced an opening to democratic process, their goal was to retain as much power as possible. And they thought they could do that because of the one party state apparatus that they had throughout the country. And they thought they could just integrate the, um, the others who were wanting to get into the system, that is the, uh, the other two groups, without making any real fundamental changes. They wanted the appearance of change without real change. The second group that was contending for power and very excited about the possibility of getting back into power were the Southern Hutu who had uh, been in the head of the government for the first decade of independence. And their goal was to gain power, to be included in the process of governing. Initially, I think they, they saw themselves joining the existing process with newly formed political parties that were in opposition to that of the president. So their vision, I would call an evolutionary vision of change. The third group that was contending for power were the, uh, were the Tutsi from outside the country that had invaded the country and were um, demanding that, um, that they get the, that the refugees could come back. And as I mentioned, what, they were, what their demands were, they wanted the assurances of inclusion in the democratic process and security for the Tutsi ethnic group. But their vision was totally different from the other two, which saw themselves working within the system as it existed. They wanted, the, the Tutsi wanted to, to, to totally revamp the system to, and to have, find one that would have one that would be unencumbered with the existing monopoly of power by the president and his party. And for them, the peace talks became the vehicle for gaining their goals. And it, at the peace talks, the RPF uh, had a voice for the Tutsi. They didn't have any voice inside the country. Uh, and, this, and at the peace talks, they could be equal to the government delegation. And they also were able at the peace talks to find common ground with that group of the second group that was contending for power, the Hutu from the South that were in opposition to the president. And they were able to find common ground on power sharing issues and on limiting presidential power. Their vision was one of revolutionary change. I mentioned the Tutsi inside Rwanda. Their goal was just to survive. They knew from experience that they would be the victims of reprisals for the RPF's invasion. And they also knew that 
they were considered accomplices of the RPF, regardless of any evidence to support this. The diplomatic community was also a group that was um, active in the, this period of time in Rwanda. And they weren't just innocent bystanders. They were uh, generally supporting the Rwandans in their quest for political pluralism and the establishment of peace. Um, but but there and there were some differences within the community, but generally the there was a lot of support for what was uh, for for the transitions. The United States had very few security interests in this small French speaking country in the mountains of Central Africa, but the United States did want peace in the region. And so for that reason, the United States through its support, behind the democratization process and the peace process as a means to establish a framework within which all of the groups might be able to resolve their differences peacefully. And we maintained this support throughout all of the ups and downs and the turmoil of the, uh, of the next three years. And the ambassador spent a lot of his time working with the political parties, uh, on the question of negotiations for the de uh, for the democratization, I worked a lot with the civil society groups, particularly the human rights advocates, supporting them in their work, encouraging them, and with women's groups. And uh, the USIA officer worked with journalists, promoting responsible journalism. Uh, there was a lot of irresponsible journalism, and uh, were and encouraging an independent judiciary. Uh, the, genes the concept of genocide just wasn't in my thoughts or in my vocabulary. It, we were much more optimistic than that and, and really didn't, didn't look at the negative side, kept our hopes up, and we were quite excited about things when I first got there. Uh, there were some early successes for democracy, democratization, uh, after about um, in, the, during, in the end of the first year, of uh, the legaliz legalized parties, the president did appoint a coalition government that was able to pave the way for the peace talks, primarily because this new government was led by an opposition prime minister and an opposition foreign minister. This changed the dynamic totally in discussions with the R Rwandan Patriotic Front. And so after a year and a half of this simmering war at the border, the RPF and the government forces that had been fighting in a northeast part of the country uh, had uh, agreed to a ceasefire and to go to peace talks that got underway in Arusha, Tanzania, the neighboring country, and facilitated by the Tanzanians. And there were also diplomatic observers. And this began in the summer of 1992. And all of this was taking place against a backdrop in Rwanda of violence. And every time that there was some success in the uh, democratization or the peace process, the violence would escalate. And it was, it was quite, um, it looked to us most, we treated it mostly as an obstacle to moving forward rather than as a conflict that needed to be addressed. So why did things fall apart? I'll briefly just mention five things that I think have uh, are of some significance in creating a um, atmosphere in Rwanda that allowed genocide to happen. The first is that the historical legacy offered a very weak foundation for democracy and peace. There were deep fissures in the society between ethnic groups, Hutu majority, Tutsi minority, and regional groups, the Northern Hutu and the Southern Hutu. And these were dated back to colonial times. The uh, pre-colonial times, the Tutsi had ruled Rwanda, what's most of what's now Rwanda, as a, with a monarchy for nearly 400 years and uh, ruled over the peasantry in a feudal relationship. And this was exacerbated during the colonial period when the uh, 
Belgians sent Tutsi administrators into parts of what's now Rwanda that had never been conquered. And so here they were administering Hutu who were very resentful of their presence. Second thing, not, uh, besides the deep hatreds, there's a, no tradition of power sharing. The pendulum of power always swung from one extreme to the other. First the Tutsi, then the Hutu from the South, then the Hutu from the North. So it's, it was never uh, any chance for examples of compromise or cooperation across ethnic or regional fault lines. There were also, in his, historically, well-established cycles of Hutu violence against minority Tutsi. So, um, and th this, the, the first govern, government after independence that was run by the Southern Hutu, uh, in, political violence at independence and then periodic pogroms by the Hutu majority uh, during that first decade forced Fin uh, finally, about 500,000 to a million Tutsi to flee Rwanda to the security and safety of neighboring countries where they became refugees. And periodically they'd try to fight their way back. The government would crush their incipient efforts and then would also uh, turn towards the, the local Tutsi with more violence and send them fleeing across the government, the borders. And so this, this uh, cycle re repeated itself several times in the first 10 years of the country's existence as an independent country. The second thing I want to point out is making uh, the situation conducive to uh, the, the violence as, uh, as horrible as a genocide was that the Hutu who were in power and stayed in power pretty much dominating all of the levers of power for most of uh, the period that, that we're talking about, the four years, the three years, uh, 1990 to 1994, um, used this power monopoly to stoke mutual fear and hatred between the Hutu and the Tutsi. The radio was one of the tools that was able to do this with vitriolic uh, campaign against uh, the Tutsi that do demonized, denigrated, and dehumanized them as the other. It was also used, the radio, the, and that was the government radio they could use. Later, when they had lost control of the government radio, these hardline Hutu supremacists turned to a private radio that they had founded and used it to, uh, again, uh, the first time they were using it to divide uh, the, the country along ethnic lines. And the, the later, when they used it, they were using it to unite the Tutsi across Re, across regional lines, getting the and they were successful in getting the northern Hutu and the southern Hutu to rally around the Hutu solidarity um, slogan, and this changed the the alignment of the forces in the uh, in the the con contest for power to being two uh, instead of three. Instead of two Hutu groups and one Tutsi group, there was Tutsi versus the Hutu, uh, Hutu versus the Tutsi. And the uh, result of this effort was polarization in the country that successfully isolated the moderates who continued to advocate for uh, power sharing, which was the, the fulcrum of, of the, where the change was, if you were for power sharing or against power sharing. And the, well, those who remained being, the Hutu that remained favorable to power sharing were labeled as traitors to the Hutu cause and enemies and considered enemies just as much as any Tutsi. The rule of law or the absence of the rule of law was another uh, thing that the, the uh, uh, people in power were able to use to their advantage and they were able to commit horrendous uh, human rights violations with impunity the result of, of the fact that there was no um, rule of law was that they also had no accountability. Uh, there was no way to hold these, these people accountable for massacres, for uh, threats against democracy advocates, random violence, uh, targeted violence. 
And it also offered no protection for those who off, who were supporting the advocate, who were supporting democratization and advocating change, such as the human rights, uh, uh, the human rights advocates. And the Rwandans, I must say, were at were masterful at creating uh, what I call webs of ambiguity, in within which the the, the answers to who did what became very ambiguous they they would each they would have plausible di di plausible deniability for uh any of these any action that anything that took place that was a, that everybody was able to point the finger at the other person and it just depended on which side you uh, found yourself who you would believe the third thing i want to mention is that there was a flawed peace agreement the, the, the peace talks were very serious, very long, very hard, very, very difficultly, difficult to negotiate. The centerpiece was a power, were power sharing provisions. When these were agreed in um, Arusha before the people, the politicians in Kigali had come to what they felt was the best way to handle it, uh, the hardliners, in Kigali, the Hutu supremacists, the president's people, the, those people who were farther even to the right than, than the president's people the, with the, uh, the Hutu supremacists, were the ones that, um, at, that uh, absolutely categorically rejected all of these um, provisions. They said that the president's people said it would relegate them to being a permanent minority and they couldn't accept that. The um, Hutu supremacists rejected the idea that they were relegated to being a minor party with a very minor role in the future uh, governance of Rwanda. So this was a very large group that, that rejected what was, had been decided. On the other hand, the uh, Tutsi-led RPF and the Hutu opposition that was leading the government delegation at the talks were quite happy with the way it turned out. And for them, it was a revolutionary agreement with the way that would totally transform Rwandan society, reorder the power sharing relationships and give them a role, a very solid role in the future of the country. But of course, this kind of a split didn't bode well for the implementation and that stalled time after time after time during the six months between the signing of the accord or eight months really and the beginning of the genocide and became a very uh, big pro and was very big problem. A couple of other things to mention in transitions, you will, where you have these um, power relationships being restructured, you'll always come up with winners and losers. And the problem is how do you handle the losers? It's very important for those losing power to be kept on board and to be kept from becoming the spoilers. In Rwanda, the, um, Hutu extreme, ex, the Hutu supremacists, this hardline group uh, that I would call, the, it's called the CDR, uh, went by those initials, they were um, deliberately excluded from the process on three separate occasions, and despite diplomatic counsel to the contrary. The, the essence, the, the issue of inclusion versus exclusion was, was actually very important. And when they were, after the third exclusion, they really had nothing to lose by turning to violence. And they had nothing to gain with the, if they, without trying to uh, do the, exercise this violence. Um, and so they, their, that was their fallback strategy and there was for retaining power was simply killing their enemy. And when the president's plane was shot down on the 6th of April, uh, it, it triggered putting this plan into action and then genocide followed and ravaged the country for the next hundred days. So where did diplomacy get off the track? Uh, we failed to realize that our policies in support of democracy and peace were leading to neither. Instead, each advance in the transition 
uh, in either transition was met with violence and and uh, and the, the coming as backlash against those who wanted democratization and and peace to fail because they knew that they would be the ones that would be the losers they would be the ones to lose power and privilege and this would and this was totally alien to what they were trying to accomplish and so in essence the support for our support for democracy and peace were fueling the fame, flames of conflict from these who were determined these people who were determined to hold on to power and privilege in rwandan society and every time uh, that there was this increase in in um in violence our response as the u.s government was to press harder press the government authorities and the political authorities harder for uh um to achieve this their their democratization and peace to put into place the new structures but no amount of more or better democracy would have changed the calculation of those spoilers who rejected the transitions and tried to thwart them and undermine them at every turn with their backlash of violence. The problem was that we didn't have any answer to the violence. We needed to have some explicit preventive diplomacy policies and programs uh, that would balance our pro-democracy and pro-peace policies. And I want to just also mention in this context Another point that I think a big turning point for democ for di for diplomacy, and uh, where we had a chance to make a decision that we, uh, and that is whether or not and when to walk away from peace talks, when this uh, very controversial power sharing arrangement was put in was was accepted in Arusha and determined to be the answer the end that there was no renegotiation going to take place um <clears throat> the di diplomats decided that instead of risking having the peace talks fall apart they would prefer to keep the peace the parties talking and so we continued to support this flawed agreement and expected that it could be revisited and maybe revamped during the implementation phase. Of course, it never quite got that far. Um, so that's those are some of the reasons that I think where we got off the track as in diplomacy. But how could it become more effective at preventing the next genocide? And I'll just uh, briefly state the the five points that I made at the end of the book. Um, I think we need to make conflict prevention a priority of foreign policy and diplomacy. As it is now, that we have we work in a culture that uh, prioritizes and defaults to the culture of responding to crises. I think we need to put a lot more effort, a lot more money, a lot more resources into preventing the cult into building a culture of prevention of crises rather than waiting until they happen and responding to them. And uh, the and in order to do this, we need to strengthen the foundation for conflict prevention diplomacy within the bureaucracy and in the foreign policy, um, uh, other parts of the administration that deal with foreign policy. And two things that I would cite uh, two of the many things that would, we could do to help in that direction would be to um, improve our ability to identify and respond to early warning signs. We can come back to that if anybody wants to talk more about that. And we also need to improve our triage of hotspots at risk of conflict escalation. There's absolutely no way that Rwanda at any point in this tragic descent into genocide would have been put on that list of countries, of watch countries. 
um, because the, the the way that we the criteria for determining them normally has to do with our national security and how we define national security. And Rwanda didn't measure up to our uh, being a national security threat. So my suggestion is that we need to somehow broaden the concept of national security to include humanitarian issues and the idea of human security. Um, there are an awful lot of humanitarian problems in the world today that really are not going to be fixed with military means. The third thing that we need to do, I think, is to strengthen diplomatic policy making for conflict prevention uh, by understanding better transitional societies and what some of the dynamics are. We're often working in tra transitions. I, I, I used to have the funny idea that there was a start and an end. There aren't. We're always in transition. But uh, to understand the dynamics of transitional societies that are trying to make fundamental change where one group has been in charge and others are trying to gain access to participate equally in the decision making is where we need to be putting a lot of our efforts and trying to understand better what those dynamics are. And we have to be alert to unintended consequences of well-intentioned policies. We should have been able to predict that conflict would arise in this situation, uh, but we didn't. And uh, for us, it was an unintended consequence of what happened, and we weren't ready to, to address it. And we ought to be also better versed in regional relationships and their implications for our policies. Fourth, I would propose that we improve our diplomatic preparedness for conflict prevention diplomacy through training. Um, there were so many issues that we could have done better at, and we need to really study some of these, the, the, the ways that, that we might handle better. For example, um, the, the concept of hate, hate speech. How do we, how do we uh, work with, with uh, in these societies to curb the kind of vitriolic propaganda without contravening our own, uh, our own principles of freedom of speech? And how do we, um, we ought to also think in terms of using peace post-conflict act actions in pre-conflict. For example, the rule of law. Uh, we were really good at going in after everything has fallen apart and uh, trying to reconstruct a, a better judicial system, but uh, we're not very good at uh, helping when it's most needed. The last thing I would mention is that uh, we need to seek solutions to humanitarian problems of displaced people. I worked many years in refugee affairs and the re solving those problems is often left to the humanitarians. And Sada Sadaka Ogata, uh, who, Sadaka Ogata, who was the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees during that decade of the 90s was uh, says there's no human humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. And what she meant by this is that she needed the partnership of the political uh, of, of the, the political side of the diplom diplomatic house for uh, to help with with resolving, coming up with prob with ways of resolving refugees. And why do I point this out in this context? Well, of course, the Rwandan refugees were the ones that came in uh, with, armed, uh, with an armed conflict, an armed attack. And they had, the ones who were leading that were the children of, were the young, were youngsters taken to Uganda when they were five years old and uh, as refugees. And they grew up there and they were now the 30 something leaders of the, uh, of the uh, RPF. So in closing, I would quote from a sentence in my last paragraph of the book, finding effective ways to prevent mass atrocities and genocide is the unfinished business of our time. It's my feeling that I, I, what I'm, part of the reason I wrote the book is to just throw out some of the ideas, put forward an example of 
what happened, how the dynamics worked in this kind of a situation, and lay out a few ideas for discussion. I don't have any pretense to think of them as the final answers. Thank you all very much. I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, the presentation. You've condensed a lot into a, a short amount of time, so congratulations on that. We do have time for a few questions. The first comes from Keith Mind of USIP, uh, and the, the beauty of, of this is kind of forum is that we, of course, have uh, uh, a lot of diplomatic firepower in the room, uh, so uh, we're having good questions. Uh, he asks, have you thought about the otherization of our own political culture, society, and media. And are there any lessons for 2020 America from 1994 Rwanda? You spoke a bit about, for example, uh, the polarization and, uh, and that kind of uh, attitude that you witnessed. But what, what lessons could you draw for us in our own contemporary setting? Well, that's a, a good question. And it's a rather obvious one, it seems to me, when you think about the idea of having one group holding on to power and, and others trying to gain access to it. And, and the, the choices are very similar. Do you, uh, do, do you go along with the changes? How does the, how does the group in power uh, decide to act? How, what is their response going to be? Is it going to be to, uh, like the, to, to just have awareness of the idea, uh, uh, to, to, to or are they going to work with the people that want to get access? Are they going to shut them out? Want the appearance of change? Uh, I think all of those things are. Are I think we we know what some of the answers ought to be, and we know that polarization is very dangerous. It's been very very much on my mind these last few years because once Rwanda became polarized. It was almost impossible, in my view, to be able to change it back or to, to get find any chinks in this that would allow for uh, a quick enough pivot to re stop the violence. Um, when when polarization becomes um, uh, solidified, it's it's extremely. It seems to me it's very hard to walk it back. And that's why I think there is an urgency about this. And quite honestly, Keith, I don't know what the answers are. I would like to see some people come forward with some real, pro real um, helpful uh, ways of, of, of getting through to, to bring people together. And one of the things I didn't mention that, that uh, we didn't have at our, at our fingertips back then is a lot of peace building. Um, activities and policies. Something like that needs to be happening in our country. Bring, and there are examples we've, we've, we've seen on television being, bringing different groups of political um, people together to talk about and, and get to know each other as individuals rather than as the other. I mean, to, to break down that otherness uh, by by bringing people together would be very powerful. And I'm sure that there are many groups in this country that are working on that, that just doesn't seem to be um, very much of a, of a national thrust in that direction. Um, but it's a lot of, there's a lot to talk about and we could have, we could have a whole new sem a seminar on that, Keith, on this whole thing. And, um, but it is something that worries me. And I think we do have some reason to be concerned about similar things. Not that I'm saying that, I think the thing that we have that, that Rwanda didn't have is still the rule of law. And that was what was very key in South Africa, for example, at keeping that uh, situation, that transition there from uh, inflaming. It was going on at the same time as the one in Rwanda. So a lot of things to think about, Keith, and, and a lot of thing, directions that that can go in. Thank you. That was a good question. Uh, we do have another question from Natalie Schaller, who asks, uh, you mentioned, Joyce, the importance of conflict prevention and better identifying and responding to the early warning signs of conflict. Are there any specific tools in conflict prevention beyond improving diplomatic training 
that you think could best prevent uh, these future humanitarian crises? Well, obvious, uh, I think that there are a lot of things that, that can be done and that are beginning to be done. There is the, I'm sure you, some of you are aware of the new bureau, new, I guess it's not so new now, the bureau for, uh, that the State Department created for uh, stabilization operations, conflict stabilization operations. The the question the it, and they came up with some very creative things that I read about that they were doing in um, in in Syria, for example, and uh, the the uh, Holocaust Museum is also doing some creative work in these directions. Um, that um, I'm hoping that that I'll be able to talk more with them uh, in the future. So, uh, but uh, so I don't know exactly what they're doing at this point. But um, the question is, the issue is that they don't have a lot of money. They never have enough money to do the kind of work that needs to be done at the beginning of uh, uh, early on when it looks like there is a risk of conflict and conflict escalation. It's very hard, as you probably know, to get money from Congress anyway and to ask them for money for something that hasn't happened and might not happen is practically impossible unless there's some sort of, uh, of, of principles that they've accepted that there needs to be more conflict prevention. So part of the work is to uh, work with NGOs that are working on this kind of issue and doing lobbying on the Hill, uh, work with, um, with well, the, and, and try it because we do need, you need money to have, to, to do some of these things. You just, I think we, when I went back to the State Department to um, work on this uh, peace building initiative, I used to always laugh and say, well, we're, this is diplomacy on a shoestring. We had, <laughs> We had conferences overseas, and we had we went there several times a year, and and but we never had any money to really do any programs or anything, or to propose something that that might cost money. No, no, you just had it was it was talk, and it was important talk, but you couldn't go beyond that. We didn't have that. So how do you? And I have also read something to, to suggest that this atrocities prevention board, which was started in the White House under President Obama that still exists and has some, some supporters and fans. And they are also working on, on how to spread this ideology of prevention throughout the government. And they, they have claimed in some papers that I've read that they've made some progress. So I guess it means it's just partly just keeping on chipping away at it. And working with those uh, to try to spread, well, working with others to try to spread and and these kinds of ide these kinds of ideas, and it means a lot too. Uh, I think a lot a, a good point to start is with some of the peace building organizations. Um, we sometimes in our in our diplomatic bubble at the embassies don't work as closely as we perhaps should or might uh, with discretion. Uh, in mind with our our colleagues in the in the um, NGO community. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. We have uh, a number of other questions. Uh, Ambassador Hank Cohen uh, asks if you could, what what could you say about the French? Uh, do you think they helped uh, genocide take place? Can you talk a little bit about the role of of the French in this in this picture from your experience? <laughs> Thank you, Hank. You know just where to, to hit a person, don't you? <laughs> um, the I have not gone into the French or any of the other diplomatic positions in my book because I didn't feel that I was an expert on those situations. And my my association with them in the country was always just to sort of compare notes and and see how we were all working and see how we could help each other and how we could work together. Um, the French were 
associated more closely than any of the other diplomatic community, diplomatic missions with the government of, of Rwanda and with supporting that government. I did mention that they prioritized uh, security over the democratization and um, but but they were always very but they were the biggest one of the the biggest supporters of the of the government in their um, military military assistance. They were one of the mo the biggest for uh, but I don't know the numbers and I don't know all I know is that, and I know that there were other countries as well that were helping to supply um, munitions and and other uh, lethal weapons like the Egyptians and the South Africans. But the French were, um, were definitely closer to the government and they were the ones that evacuated uh, most many of the uh, government officials and that and France is where they still live. <laughs> um, and that's where we, we just found uh, Kabuga lately in Paris, for example, hiding in plain sight. Um, so yes, they were definitely much closer and did they really help, um, create the genocide? I, I, I wouldn't go so far, uh, as to, to say that, um, of course, you know, others have said that we're the ones that created the genocide, uh, that, that new book about, what was that one named, something about blood that blamed ev everything was blamed on the RPF and we were the ones that were behind the RPF, they claimed, which I find uh, interesting, but difficult to accept. Um, so the French were closer and, but I can't say that we can blame it all on them. I think that the Rwandans have enough uh, independence to have made their own bed and to make the, the situation for themselves as difficult as they did. Thank you. We have a question from Lawrence Richter, which follows along these lines, but with regard to the international community. And he asks, the international community has seen enough, or had at that point, seen enough potential for violence that the UN provided peacekeeping troops, but their rules of engagement didn't seem to allow them to adapt when things started to fall apart. Do you also see a need for a broader mandate for the international community to take on a more expansive role or at least to be granted broader rules of engagement so they can respond more nimbly if things start to unravel in these types of uncertain, ambiguous situations? What are, what are your thoughts regarding the international community? Thank you, Larry, for that question. And we know that, and uh, thank you for all you did in Rwanda especially when you even we went back after the genocide in that horrible time to help uh, get everybody's belongings home. Um, I think that um, this, is a, this is a very important issue. And again, I didn't dwell on the international or UN side of things in my book because I felt that that was not, again, my forte. But what I saw from where I was and where I sat was that um, the the UN force that was sent was not large enough and it didn't have robust enough mandate or rules of engagement to meet the needs that they were being asked to address. Um, the, the, it, the, the force that came to the U to Rwanda was pared down considerably from what, General Dallaire re, re, um, requested, or from what his, was written in his report to the UN, and even that was watered down from what he thought was needed. He was always thinking, and I was one of the people that um, had a chance to talk to him when he first came to uh, Rwanda for the reconnaissance mission about what the mission should look like in August, right after the um, peace accord was signed. And he was already thinking, well, you know, we, we know we're not going to get a big force because the Americans won't, won't 
go for it, the, this won't go, you know, they, he was already looking at some of the political considerations before he even wrote his, his, um, his report. So, and I think that, that, that they needed, and the fact that their rules of engagement were well known, unless they were being shot at, they weren't allowed to respond. And this meant that they had, the forces that did stay in Rwanda after the genocide began had to watch what was happening. And this uh, leading to General Dallaire's nervous breakdown. And it was, it was, it must have been just horrible for, for him and the others who had no, uh, no authority, no way to, to um, respond. So do they need to have a better, uh, robust, more robust? Yes. Are we going to get it? Probably not because then the, the, the one of the answers that the UN says, well, if we make them roles too robust, that'll put the forces, the UN forces at risk, and we won't get any forces to volunteer to be in the, U in the, in the, um, in the peacekeeping operations. So there's an awful lot that's being balanced there, but frankly, they've got, there's got to be a better way to uh, match the rules of engagement, the mandate, and the size of the force, the composition of the force with the needs at hand. I mean, even just to the point of language, I mean, when the genocide started, people would, were calling the UN for help and they couldn't, uh, they weren't understood because no, the person answering the phone only spoke English, was Bangladeshi. So, I mean, you know, that's a very simple little thing, but it was pretty important at that particular time um, so it's got to be, there's got to be a little bit, and there has been some, there are a lot of work done on this and that they, they, they're getting a little better in terms of, uh, supporting the, um, um, securing, securing the, 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 the non-combatants, helping the, the non-combatants to stay safe, but, um, there's still a lot of work to do, obviously. Thank you. We had a, a follow-up question from Heath Mines that looks maybe now we've gone from the international back looking inward a bit, um, and he agrees with the contention that with regard to the U.S. policy, we need to work on our own architecture, both policy and field for, for doing things better. Uh, what specific changes would you suggest? I mean, for example, what is the division of labor within the State Department between CSO, or the regional bureaus, or when looking at USAID or the Department of Defense, how could a new administration do this better as it makes policy? What what recommendations would you suggest? Um, th this is one of this is a very good question, and I've been away from Washington and from the State Department for quite a long time now, so I, I'm not so well versed. But I have um, read that. For example, the CSO has uh, put some people, has some, some kind of a setup where they have links to the regional bureaus now, because I think mainstreaming the concept of, of um, prevention is very important. It can't just hang out there at a, uh, at a functional bureau. Um, I was still, I was working on the, ish, the problem of central the 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 what I went when I went back in to the State Department, I was uh, working on this the Central Africa thing and the very first iteration of the CSO. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was called, but it was it, it was the people were put into the secretary's office and they would come to the region to the regional office and try to talk to us about what they could do and how they could do it, and it was kind of like ho oh, hum, these people are taking my time. I got to get back to my desk <laughs> for something else. And uh, so it it's really is an issue if they're not somehow embedded. I thought of an, one idea that um, the function, each of the uh, regional offices has usually a regional bureau for that region. And those people ought to be the link with CSO and they should be con con collecting 
um, information, data uh, about incipient problems in their region and working with the CSO uh, in prioritizing them from that from their perspective. So that would be one kind of link. How do you get uh, USAID and you and the and the Department of Defense to work? Well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, there there there's in such different spheres, but somehow there needs to be. And you, I think the CSO actually has a coordinating responsibility for the entire. What do they call that? Whole of government. Um, but some of these things, unless they can be um, in the mainstream, aren't going to get a lot of attention. And I, I, I think it's a wonderful question and a wonderful way. And we need to try to, I don't know, how can those of us who are outside the State Department get some of these ideas inside the State Department? That's another issue, maybe. Have some. Uh, Cross fertilization. Thank you. Well, I think we have time for one final question. It was a point of clarification, I believe, from Margaret McKelvey. Uh, she oh. was just she was curious as to why do you think the secretary's prevention action initiative didn't really take hold? Is it because responding is much easier than preventing? Margaret, I need some clarification on your question. She's referencing, um, uh, I'm not sure if, she's referencing Secretary Albright, the, the conflict prevention action initiative. It, it didn't really take hold. Is it, in general, would you say, is it easier to, to respond to crises rather than prevent them? Is, it, is that the reasoning or just out of curiosity, what, why do you think it didn't take hold? Well, um, I'm not quite sure, Mar Margaret, hello, and uh, thank you for all that you've done in your career with refugee affairs, especially in Africa. Uh, the, I'm not familiar with this conflict prevention initiative, unless you're referring to her, uh, the, the task force that she did on, on genocide prevention, which she was, uh, when she, she, I think that, that, uh, initiative was the one that invented the term uh, conflict prevention diplomacy or pre preventive diplomacy was the word I think that they that they uh, that they fashioned in that and why did it not take hold it was they did they were they did that they report did that report some sometime back in uh, I think it was 2000 maybe as far back as 2008 or 9 or something like that it might have been just a little bit before its time i think that that uh it's still an important document uh along with the um responsibility to protect document that actually came out um way back when in 2000 2001 or something but um, but all of this, th these things should not be lost. They need to continue to inform us because they're, they have so many important uh, suggestions and ideas. I tried not to steal from them, but um, I probably have some of those embedded in my thinking as well. <laughs> oh, well said. Well said. Well, I'm mindful of uh, people's time. I just want to thank you again on behalf of ADST, uh, Joyce Leader. That was an excellent uh, conversation, a good presentation. And I want to thank everyone for joining us in this uh, virtual diplomatic lunch initiative <clears throat> during a time of pandemic. What <laughs> We're trying to help promote discussions of these types. And uh, I, I think your insights are very helpful and one of the beauty, beautiful things that we have here is that we look to the past and our history and lessons learned to try and help uh, prevent crises that you've witnessed and, and help inform how we do policy in the future. So thank you very much for your time and for your efforts. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. 
Again, follow us uh, at adst.org through social media. And if you're interested in, in getting uh, that, a copy of, uh, of the book, it can be purchased. It's info at adst.org. You can write to us uh, at ADST and we'll help uh, facilitate that. But thanks again, Joyce. I wish you all well, the thank best. You. Thank you to all of you for your excellent questions. And um, I am uh, open to further discussion by email or whatever or Zoom or whatever, <laughs> if anybody's interested. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.